nut. Okay? Your artist is doing your composite, puts the nut in there, makes sure it looks good, that's not everyone can sign off the shot. But when you render it and give it back to the editors or back to the colorists, don't give it with a LUT, give it without the LUT so that the colors can work on it. I always request it personally, yeah. Mainly so that I know my artists can get on and work on stuff. Uh, yeah. But do you say technically you understand? Yeah. That's the, that's the, yeah, it's important to use the right terminology. Yeah. Tech grade is quite universal, I think. Um, yeah. Um, and also your supervisor, if you're supervising, some of the supervisors already made an arrangement with the cinematographer. And also the tech grade, that's a good point actually. The tech grade, when that takes place, the people in that color suite, you know, in the grade session, is the respect supervisor, the director, sometimes the director, sometimes not, the cinematographer. It's very important cinematographers in that room because the cinematographer want to make sure that the picture he or she has shot is going to look good. Can you imagine someone coming in and going, what have you done to my picture? That's why they've got to be there. And they understand the, the, the lighting, they understand the look of the show, they've discussed the look of the show, the director, way in advance. So that's why it's important they're in this. Uh, another reason also is why I request for a LUT. When I show dailies to the client, the client don't want to look at something that's, that's, that's looking like that. They don't understand. They're like, well, what is this? Is it going to look washy? They want to look, something that looks at, look at something that looks quite close to the final thing. And that's where the, that, that tech grade comes in. Or you can also request a creative grade later. So the tech grade is to start the process. And then while you're doing dailies, you can work with the director and the colorist to do certain looks. So on the show Aliens, we had four big sequences. One of the big sequences outside of the city that had its own look. And then when we were, when we were inside the, this nightclub, it had its own look. And we create different creative LUTs for those. That's another way of working. Okay, so now we're getting to visual effects, right? So, again, everything, everything I'm explaining here is not technical. This is stuff. This is as technical as you need to be from a producer. So basically, everything you know here, if you know this as a producer, you'll be fine. You can go and quote. You'll understand. You'll be able to talk to your artists. And this is another thing. One of the reasons that I think it's very important that the VFX producers understand the basic fundamental pipeline of the visual effect process and the CG process and understand what they're asking for is because if you're a small company, not a big company, if you're a small boutique company, the producer sometimes end up coordinating, right? They end up working with the artists. And I know for a fact that if if I was an artist today, and my producer asked me to do something, I'd be like, really? Do you know what's involved? You want me to do a full-on environment in two days? You know, you want to earn the respect of your artist. More importantly, you want to communicate easily to your artist. You want your artist to be able to trust in you as a producer. So, so remember I was telling you earlier that the producer's job is about the budget, it's about the schedule, it's about winning the job, it's about liaising and communicating with the client and all the departments, right? There's also another part of your job as a producer is to keep calm. That's a t-shirt, I'm pretty sure there's a t-shirt that says that somewhere. It's about keeping calm. If you are freaking out as a producer, if you're panicking, and of course you would be because you know, it's your job is to think about the bigger picture, but if you are panicking and stressed and your artists see your stress, they'll get stressed, they'll get worried. One of the things I learned from very good, like over the years, I've worked with really good producers. I've worked with really bad ones too. And I've learned stuff with the bad ones, how not to be a producer. But um, I remember on one of the bad ones, you know, she would, um, she would panic. She would get stressed. And she would go, oh, we're not going to deliver this show on time. Oh my God, we're so over budget. Artists don't want to hear that. Artists want to know that they have the support from their producer. So this is the other part of the job. Your job to produce is to support your team. That's your job, you're a supporter. That's what you are. You're not here to whip them to hurry up to work, and get stuff done on time. I mean, there is a bit of that, but your job is to, if an artist comes to you and say, listen, I can't get this shot done. Your job is to figure out how can we get this shot done. Maybe this person needs more people to help, or maybe this artist is not the right artist for this shot. Maybe this artist is not the best compositor. Maybe he's good at lighting, you can put him on lighting. 
very important to always understand your artists. Your artists are your resources, right? If you look at producers of video game, your artists, they're basically your, 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 how, how you're gonna win the game by having the best artists, managing the best artists. Very important. So in terms of CGI workflow, we've got our CG, which is like environment, and the sort of tools you use will be like, you know, similar for the 3D Max Maya. Now, later on I'll explain software and tools and how that's relevant to a producer. You probably think it isn't. Like most producers don't really care if it's Maya or Max. But the ones that do care have a reason for caring. And the reason for that is recruitment. Right? Sometimes when I'm producing a show and I've got say I need some amazing dynamic stuff, like you know, explosions. And I know the best artists I can get use the software for Houdini, right? But I don't have Houdini. So I'm not gonna dismiss this artist and try and get a Maya artist or get a 3D Max artist and force them to try and get the best explosion. Because they're not gonna do it well. It's nothing to do with the tool, it's nothing to do with the technology. It's the artist. And that's what you have to remember from producers' point of view. Technology and tools doesn't make best visual effects. It's the artist that make the best visual effects. Your job is to support them with the right tool, the right schedule, and manage them right to get the visual effects done looking amazing, right? So I've hired Houdini artists. I've rented a license to Houdini because I know that this artist is going to nail it. This artist is going to make the best looking explosion. My client's going to love me. And most importantly, I'm going to get it delivered on time and not lose any money. Now, flip it on the other side. Flip on the other side, I don't want to hire Houdini artists. Oh, I don't want to rent Houdini. Oh, let's just use a Maya. Let's just use our existing Maya artists or Houdini Mac and just force them. And they'll keep doing version after version. And you'll get there, but after 20 versions, when you could have done three versions of the Houdini Mac. So that's how producers think when they're dealing with software and tools. Right? So that's, that's one example. There you go, dynamics. So, so already we explained 3D involves character involves modeling. So when, whenever you've got a lot of 3D work, from a producer point of view, think about what artists you're gonna hire to do modeling, texturing, shading. Or you can hire a generalist. I love generalists. I love working generalists because the reason I like working generalists is because I know I can keep them on longer. If I hire a modeler, that model will work when the model's finished, and then they go. And if I want to tweak that model, I'll have to rehire them again. Because if I've got a generalist, he or she can model texture, comp, and then I keep the one, and I, I build a better relationship. My team is much stronger. And I like to work with the same people, and I'm sure you guys do too. So that's again one of the things you think about as a producer. Dynamics. This is the, probably one of the most expensive parts in visual effects, I think is fluids, any natural phenomena, like water, fire, smoke, that needs to be done with visual effects, it's very expensive if you want it done correctly, right, or real. But, you want the work, so you have to, you know, you have to figure it out. And, you know, from a producer's point of view, the question I ask is, you know, how long is the shot? Because when it comes to dynamics, the longer the shot, the more simulation time. And one of the things you need to think from a producer point of view is not the rendering. The rendering of this sort of work is not that bad. It's the simulation. So when you're doing stuff like water or anything with gravity or wind or fire, you're telling the computer to calculate, right? Now, I've had, I've had water simulation run for one week on the computer. This simulated, right? And it simulates, and the simulation looks like this. So it's not a finished thing, that's just the simulation, right? The weight, the gravity, the speed. And when it's wrong, guess what you have to do again? Redo it again, that's another week of simulation. So one of the things you've got to remember from a producer's point of view is buy a lot of hard drive space. A lot of hard drive space. Because those cache, they're called cache, they take a lot of space, a lot of, a lot of memory as well. So that's one thing to remember. Um, and the sort of software you can use it. Now, most 3D tools do dynamics, whether it's Max, Houdini, even um, Cinema 4D does it. Um, this is all down to your artist. 
So whenever you're involved in anything heavy visual effects, my advice as a producer is to sit with your team. Explain to them this is a project and get them involved. Get them involved. You know, even, I, I don't know, I've been an artist for many, many years. I still ask artists because they're doing the work, not you. So you need them to tell you if this is possible or not or what that needs to be done. And artists will appreciate producers communicating and you will appreciate it and then you understand it more as well. So it's very important. Animation, obviously. So animation, there's obviously things like motion capture, there's now performance capture. Uh, what's it like in Malaysia in terms of animation? In terms of like, do you, is it quite, quite used here, quite a lot of like motion capture? No? Yeah. Okay. Motion capture is pretty good, man, because um, it's not that expensive anymore. You know, maybe five, ten years ago, motion capture, you had to be a big Hollywood studio. But now they use motion capture in all the video games have motion capture. And for those of you who don't know, motion capture is basically when you wear a black suit, the ball's on there, any movement we do gets recorded on the computer. Now think from a producer's point of view, that could save you a lot of money. To have an animator to animate all the subtle nuances. You know, me standing there right now, my hand moving, every keyframe needs to be animated manually to get it real. You know, if you look at Pixar, all the animators have mirrors and they're looking in the mirror putting facial expressions and they're trying to copy that. Whereas with motion capture, you're getting that data. So if you have a heavy animation project, from a producer's point of view, it's worth thinking about motion capture and performance capture. At least investigate it, look into it, see how much does it cost. And then weigh that with how much would it cost to animate it. Also, compare it with the type of director you're working with. And this is a very important thing. Whenever, before I get involved in any project, I do a research on the director, I do a bit of research on the cinematographer that they've got attached to it. I do a bit of research about the production company. Because to me, it tells me the sort of people I'm going to be working with. Now, if it's a director that likes to change a lot, then I will have that in the back of my head when I'm budgeting. I'll put a little buffer, a contingency of X thousand pounds. But I know that if the director changes his mind, I'm like, that's okay, it's fine, you're still paying for it. So, yeah, and I can afford it. Um, so, yeah, it's worth doing that. Um, and also, some directors like to work with motion capture. Some directors don't want to sit in a visual effects studio and sit with animators and direct animators. And animators don't like to be directed by directors sometimes. So, like, when you're in a motion capture studio, you're dealing with actors. So, for directors, they understand that better. But for a producer, you've got data you can work with. If you are working with motion capture, when you ask for a quote for motion capture, Firstly, ask how much does it cost for, you know, for a day of motion capture? How much do they charge for prep? Do they have to prep it? Rehearsals? Mostly, at the end, how the data is exported. <coughs> On my first motion capture project, I was given a hard drive with tons of data. I don't know what to do with this data. I have no idea. Like, well, what do I do with this data? They go, oh, you need to pay an additional cost to clean it up. So, ask for all of those costs, and then you can figure out how much it's going to cost to use. That makes it much more affordable. Um, lighting and rendering, the most important part in CG, obviously. Um, and again, the renderers you use really dictate on the sort of look that you're going to go for. Yeah, again, this is all artist driven, or your lead driven, or your CG supervisor driven. You know, Arnold, who's using <coughs> Arnold here? Ah, uh, you have to check out Arnold, man. Arnold's cool. So we all know what mental ray is, right? The mentor is your kind of the standard default renderer. Arnold is quite a new one. V-Ray, anyone use V-Ray here? Yeah, V-Ray is kind of cool. Now, these are all good renderers and they all pretty much do the same thing, except some do things better. Some, like for example, Arnold takes a lot of geometry. Yeah, so you can take hundreds and thousands and millions of geometry and it will render it perfectly, super fast. All the shadows, everything. But what it does not very good at is transparency. Things like see-through windows or, or see-through shirts. It can't do transparency very well. Whereas V-Ray doesn't like to take in too much geometry, but it does transparencies and textures really well. So again, it's all down to your pipeline. And as a producer, that's as technical as you need to be at this point. Um, who's heard of Renderman? Yeah, so Renderman was developed by Pixar, right? 
Random Man is kind of used in the big studios. Um, Rhythm Hughes used it? Random Man? No? Well, like, ILM use it, MPC use it. Um, and again, it's now becoming more affordable, but again, all of this tools is based on the sort of artists you hire or the sort of artists you have in the house. Matte paintings. So we know what matte paintings are, right? Yeah? I love matte paintings, they're great. Matte paintings are really old, man. Yeah, matte paintings are like back in the 1930s they were doing matte paintings on glass. The thing about matte paintings today is the matte painter that you hire is not the same matte painter you would hire 10 years ago. 10 years ago, when we were hiring matte painters, we wanted the best concept artist, the best Photoshop artist. Today, matte painters are matte painters stroke compositors. Because now, when a matte painting is done, you don't just deliver a PSD file, you sometimes get a nuke screen. Because the matte painter will break up the layers in nuke and make sure everything's lined up properly. Because they want to make sure that the artist or the compositor is using the matte painting correctly making sure the layers are, have the right opacity and making sure that the distance between them are correct for parallax. So whenever I hire a matte painter, I always ask them, do they have any new experience, any comp experience, any two and a half C experience? They don't need to be an amazing composter, but they should be able to bring in their layers and layer up the camera and test it out. So that's today's matte painting. Uh, and a lot of that is done in comp, obviously, with camera projection. You know, sometimes, on one show we worked on, we built geometry for the mountains, and then we project one layer of the map painting onto the geometry, so it fills 3D. So this way, the 3D department comes in. You know, map, this 2.5D approach can save a lot of money. Like, I remember on, this, on the sequence we worked with on the TV show, you know, there was a big, like, mountains and trees, and the director wanted to slow push in the camera, and we were thinking, oh man, it's like, and it's like a thousand frames? It's a long shot, because there's narration on top of it, right? We're like, it's a thousand frames, and we thought, what's that? The camera's not doing this, the camera's not doing this, it's no motion blur, why don't we just split the things up and do it all in new? And we did it. And you can put how many frames you want, it doesn't matter, it's new, it's quite fast. So two and a half D from a producer point of view, it's worth asking, can we do this in two and a half D? And again, understand the shot, understand what the director wants a lot. But make it clear to the director that once we go this route, we can't do this and do this or do this. <laughs> so make them understand that. If they understand it, it's good. Motion graphics. I'm a massive fan of motion graphics, man. Like, um, motion graphics come a long way. Back in, the, you know, back in the day, five years ago, maybe, or maybe 10 years, maybe, Imagine that it's just used for interface, yeah? You know, like computer interfaces or, or robot vision. Today, motion graphics are very integral to the production pipeline process. What I mean is, if you look at films like James Bond or look at Prometheus, all the computer graphics you see there, they're playing in real time, for real. Which means that this is now done not in VFX. This is not done in post. This is done before they're shooting it. And this is now becoming so important that the actors refer to the motion graphics on those monitors. They don't do it in post anymore. Because that's how high-end it looks. This comes at Territory Studios, do it, MPC got their own department. Which is very important. And also, motion graphics is one of those visual effects components which, if anything, helps tell the story from a visual point of view. For example, back on this shot here, we have critical damage. It's flashing. Everything's going crazy. No one needs to speak to tell you it's going crazy. You know it's going crazy. You see red critical damage. That's visual communication. In <coughs> directors use that to an advantage a lot. So sometimes if you're being asked to quote on a job and there's user interface, the way to approach it from a producer point of view is try to understand it from a story point of view. Tell them what is what is the story? Why are we using like, graphics for this? And if you ask that question, the client will look at you and go, "You really care about this film. I want to work with you." Now, if you go, "Oh, just tell me how many shots and um, you know what's the style of it," it's too service. And this is the problem about this industry. It can become very service, and it is a service industry. At the end of the day, you are doing something for a client. 
But the ones who always get repeat work, or the ones who get noticed, are the ones that care about the project. And the way to show you care about the project, not just by doing great work, is by asking the right questions. And it's usually the producers, the visual effects producers, and the visual effects supervisors. They're in the front line. They are the facing. The directors don't work with the artists a lot. Most of the time, it's the producers and the and the VFX supervisors. Ask the right questions. And the question: If you relate to story, this is what's so this is what's changed about our industry these days. When you're now working in visual effects, the story is so important. It's not just about pretty pictures. Your job as a visual effects company is to help tell that story with the director using visual effects. You do not want to use visual effects to take over the film. Films that do that don't tend to do very well. So it's worth remembering that. My favorite, compositing. As a company, I would say 65 to 75% of your work would always be compositing. That's a fact. Most studios get more comp work. And that could range from simple painting rig removal, painting reflections out, painting shadows out, you know, boom shadows. Uh, Retiming, reframing, respeeding. That's, that's kind of like bread and butter work, right? That's kind of like paint the bills work in visual effects. Um, and again, you need to have the right people involved in this. So when it comes to compositing, the sort of things that a VFX producer should know is what's involved in that stage. Tracking. Sometimes if it's a big show, you have a different tracking department. But if you're a small company, your compositor or your 3D artist should be good at tracking. Um, what I always do is, I always tell the artist to track it in the composite software first. If they can't get a good track in Nuke, or a good track in After Effects or Fusion, then go into PF Track. Never ever tell the artist they have PF Track all the time. Because one of the things I learned, the aliens actually, the aliens are good, because the aliens we, we were rendering out cameras for the new artists because there was a lot of matte paintings we had to put in the background. And I was finding that the artists were becoming very lazy. They are like, oh, we don't need to track that, just give it the PF track, give it to them, got the 3D track up. And sometimes it's bad because you want to use your resources smartly. You don't want one guy to keep tracking all the time because he knows how to track. No. So you want to make sure that compositors don't lose their practice. It's important. And this is the balance about running a company, running a business, running a project, and also developing your team, nurturing your staff. Because you want your team to get better and better. You don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over again. Because firstly, it's boring. Second, they'll leave the company and go somewhere else. And you don't want people to leave. You want to hold on to your best team. So your job to produce us, they're always, that's part of support, is to keep nurturing them and make sure they don't get lazy. Rotan paint is like so important, man. Like, the amount of artists that dismiss it, oh, we don't want a Rotan paint. That's for juniors. That's below me. No. You, I've seen shots that have beautiful CG, but one wobbly Roto will make the whole shot look rubbish. One wobbly Roto. That's why Roto is, has to be perfect. Now, Everyone can do Roto, but the ones, you, the sort of artists you want to hire are artists that know how to Roto smartly. Not Roto every single frame that they think is good. You know, like when I was a compositor, I would, I would combine Roto with keying to get the best, right? And that's smart, it's quicker. From a producer's point of view, those are the sort of things you need to look at. So, as a producer, I can say this shot is going to be a two-day shot to, to, to get a mat. You want to know what a mat is, right? A black and white mat, a rotor shape. I will say two days. So when the artist goes, oh, I need more than two days, I would ask the artist, why do you need two days for? Tell me why you need two days for. Show me why you need two days for. And when, you, when they tell me, well, I'm going to rotate every single frame, I'm like, okay. And the hair, I'm going to paint the hair. I'm like, why? Why don't you just key it? Oh, there's no green screen but you have a sky that's blue, or the hair is black and the wall is white, why can't you get a luminance key? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> right? So, this is why it's good for producers to have the basic knowledge, then you can ask those questions. 
And then the artist will think twice about saying, oh, it's going to take a long time. And obviously there's integration, where you make sure everything's gelled in properly. Now, it depends how big your project is. If you've got a big project, then you probably want a team doing roto, a compositor doing composite, because you want the compositors to focus and finesse in the shot. Now, there is a reason why roto and paint is always a junior thing. Even though it's a very important task, which I always advise all compositors to always know how to do good roto. Always. But why do you think it's a junior position? It's always a junior position. Any guess? Yeah, yeah? Repetitive task? No else? Discipline. Discipline? Yeah. That's good. I think that's good. No else? Both of those are correct, by the way. It's repetitive and it's discipline. The discipline is good because it's a good way to enter the industry. It's a good way to yeah, test yeah. the artist, right? You're like, mm, if, you're, if you're good at writing. Yeah, exactly. But the other thing also is you don't need client sign-off in Roto. You don't need it. With Roto, there's no middle ground. It's either right or it's wrong. It's either good or shit. There's no in between, right? Whereas with compositing, there is a lot of, it's very subjective. Mm, I want it more red. Mm, can we move this to the back? Mm, oh, more motion blur. <coughs> that needs a lot of client interaction. So this is why not a rotary paint with junior. That's the only reason. And of course, this is why you're trained. Yeah. Sorry. Sure. Um, who gets the final call on how it looks like? I mean, sometimes when client reviews and things yeah. are in, uh, things are in, yeah. everyone has their own version of how, yeah. you know, and your own producers and your own uh, lead to the same things. And how many versions do you provide? Do you do all these five different people with? Very good question. This is why we have dailies. So the rule is, you have internal versions, okay? So your internal version is your lead and your VFX supervisor. The, the, the he or she who's the lead in the project creatively, right? Um, the producers don't get involved creatively. The producers, all they care about is how many versions and how much that cost me and are we hitting on time, right? But in terms of your question in terms of version, the client never see anything until the supervisor internally signs it off. So that's the version you present, right? And then when the client sees it, then the client may not like it, or they may have other ideas. They communicate that with the supervisor. And the supervisor and the client will debate. They'll work together to get the look they want, and then go back to the artist and tell the artist, this is what you need to do. So yeah, so the supervisor gets the final call, the final decision is not the supervisor. And it's important you only have one person responsible, because it's easier to manage, and also it's responsibility. And this is the thing about visual effects supervisors. I get artists all the time saying, hey, I want to be a VFX supervisor. I think it's so cool to be on set. It is cool, but it's also the big thing about VFX supervising is responsibility. If a shot looks rubbish, you <coughs> get in trouble for it, not the artist. Even if the artist has, you know, the, the rotor artist has not done a good job of the rotor, or the compositor hasn't done a good job with the compositing, you will get in trouble. You'll get your ass kicked by the client. You're the one that gets told, I don't like this, I think it's rubbish. And that's the burden you wear on your shoulders as a VFX supervisor. From a, from a visual effect producer, it's just as bad. When a shot is not delivered on time, the, the VFX producer can't say, oh, but I had this lazy artist, oh, you know, he's really slow. Clients don't care. <laughs> You're responsible for that job. You're getting in trouble. This is why the supervisors and VFX producers are quite big jobs. That's why they, they require a lot of experience. This is why I meet a lot of compositors. They say, oh, I want to be a supervisor. I can be a supervisor. I can come on set. I know about you know, HDR. I know about you know, tracking markers. That's the technical. Anyone can learn the technical. You can learn that technical anytime. What you're, being, what you're bringing to the project, when a client hires a supervisor or a VFX producer, they're hiring their experience. It gives them, as clients, confidence that they've got the job being handled by someone that's got the experience. That's why it's so important. It's why when you're a producer, you're hiring artists, you hire a different range of experience. That's why the Roto doesn't need to be 10 year experience, because it, there is no middle ground. So uh, the supervisor need to communicate with the producer in terms of the final looks? Or? No. Um, the, 
supervisor would communicate with the director, um, the client. 